the end. That was beautiful, and I love to see people smiling and singing. It makes me so happy. Um, if we have any preschoolers who would like to go out with their Bible story and their activities, Miss Rachel's right over here. Everyone else, take a few minutes and say hello to each other.
Christmas child right now. This year, we've given out the 200 million shoe box in 30 years, 200 million boxes. It's hard to fathom 200 million, but it's something God has done. Every box is important. 200 million is not any more important than the person who gave the first box. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, being able to be on the other side, to be able to pack a shoebox, to be able to deliver our shoebox to children in Ukraine, it's just an absolute privilege. Jesus. 
But Edward didn't believe. Then he got, when he was 14 years old, he received a gift. And that gift was an OCC box. It was the first gift he had ever received. He had never received a birthday gift. He had never received a Christmas gift. He had never gotten anything. He refused to open it without his mother there. And he wouldn't let his little brother open it either. And the little brother was pretty mad about that. But normally they didn't see their mother because she was gone before they got up. She was, they were in bed before she came home. So they came home this day with their boxes and their mother was standing there. He walked up to his mother and he said, I've got a gift. And so this is what he got in his box and what he showed his mother. So, take his box over. Wait a minute, I'm missing something in here. There is, I got it. Okay, what's this? Toothbrush. Toothbrush. His brother jumped up and down and said, wow, now you don't have to get up early in the morning so you can brush your teeth before me. Because the older brother felt that he really needed to use a toothbrush first before his little brother. Now they get toothbrushes. What is this? No, that's not a yo-yo. That is what David used to kill the lion. <coughs> And he ran around the village, knocking people in the head with it, having a wonderful time until he found out what it was really for, and he was disappointed. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> this one. Soap and two soaps. The family was ecstatic. That meant for a while they wouldn't have decided to feed food and soap. And not only that, his brother got two uh, bars of soap as well. That was a treasure trove for them. So when boxes are handed out, the good news is clearly presented to everyone. Then gospel booklets called The Greatest Gift are offered. This booklet explains God's greatest gift, which is his son. Then children have the opportunity to enroll in a 12-session follow-up discipleship program called The Greatest Journey. And here's a book from that one. Edward had never touched the Bible in his life before. He finally came to Jesus and accepted him as Lord and Savior. And he said, my life didn't change, my heart did. He also said, you're not packing a shoebox, but changing a life for Christ. Pack a box, then pack another one. So here we are doing what Jesus commanded, and frankly, it feels good. So what can we do? First and foremost, pray. Pray for everyone involved in OCC, for those who give, for our pastor, elders, and church staff, for those who work at all levels of the organization, for those who receive the boxes and hear the good news. For those who receive the boxes, hear the good news, and don't believe. For the Holy Spirit to work through great effort and change lives. Second, fill boxes. Take some today if you'd like. Fill them, bring them back on Dedication Sunday, which is November 11th, or, and, you can join us for a church-wide packing party on Sunday, November 5th. It will be before and after all the services. And even if you haven't had an opportunity to donate, we want you to come. Our goal is to get as many people as possible to participate. participate. Come share the joy with us. For real excitement, you will join us for the fun of setting up the fellowship hall for the packing party on Saturday, November 4th, beginning at 8 a.m and we'll continue until we're finished. Third, we need $10 a box for delivery. Delivery includes the collection of the boxes, processing the boxes, the greatest gift gospel booklets, training local churches, and shipping over 100 countries plus other project costs. Last year, we filled 318 boxes, so we needed $30 to $180 for the boxes. So we'll be collecting donations during the month of November, as well as anything else you'd like to donate. We'll also have a donation table at the church-wide packing party. Finally, we'll continue to collect toys, personal care items, hygiene items throughout the year. We'll be publishing places to get good deals to buy bulk and to buy during special sales. Our goal is to get everything on sale or with special pricing and have fun. Join our team, become missionaries, spread the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord as he commanded us to do. And if you would like to hear someone who received a box, um, his story is going to be October 15th at 4 p.m. at Hollins Road Baptist Church. 
And thank you for your kind attention. Susan, we're fortunate to have someone with your passion headed up this ministry. We live in a, a nation um, that, is, that is so wealthy and, and privileged that the idea of giving children a shoebox with a toothbrush and some soap, it, it's hard for us to imagine that there's joy in that. Uh, I think if we had those under our Christmas trees, uh, our kids may be disappointed on Christmas morning. But for many across the world, it is an incredible gift and an incredible blessing. And what, a, what an incredible way to be able to open up the gospel uh, to people by just providing basic needs. So Operation Christmas Child, fantastic ministry. Look forward to participating in the church. Uh, as you came in this morning, you grabbed a bulletin attached to it or with it was a prayer guide. There are a lot of prayer requests from church members and non-church members, family and friends on there. Uh, as well as certainly prayer requests that are on our hearts uh, this morning. Uh, so I trust that you'll be able to look over this. I did want to point your attention to one of those there under the hospital section. Uh, Tate Smith is the grandson of Mike and Susie, Susan Woody. He was supposed to have surgery on Friday at NBA. Uh, it was postponed because he has a COVID. Uh, so pray for a quick recovery for Tate. Uh, his surgery has been rescheduled for April. Uh, so, uh, on top of praying for a speedy recovery, let, let's pray that they can find a, a closer date for his surgery. Uh, I do also want to point out we have a prayer blanket up here to, to my left. Uh, this is for Annie Lee. So, if you didn't have a chance on your way in before you head out today, stop and, and pray for this blanket. Pray for me. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we lift up these prayer requests to you, knowing that. Uh, you are intimately aware of each and every situation. You know the needs uh, better than any of us do. So we we trust these requests to your will and to your providence. We pray that you will uh, act in these people's lives in a way that you see fit. Right now, Lord, we, we pray for our offering. We, think, we pray that you will take it and multiply it so that your word would be known to this town, this county, in our state, and across our nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
song that I think Satan doesn't want somebody to hear today. So play, pay close attention to the words. Um, we have a DVD. Can't get the DVD to work. So Wednesday night, um, I said, well, I'll just play, and Susan Plinch will direct. Well, John's sick, and Susan couldn't come. So plan Z is <laughs> I'm going to play, they're going to face this way, and we're going to sing you this song every break. It's a, a good day to be with you all. Um, it is right now, let me do the math, let's see, well, seven hours, at so oh, six, six or so, 6.15 uh, in Romania. So our, uh, our Romania team has been there since Monday. If you followed along on Facebook, they've been busy this week, pa packing boxes of food to ship to families uh, in, uh, where are they shipping? Uh, Ukraine, right, they ship it in, in Ukraine. Uh, they've been working at uh, the orphanage there, the Ruth School, uh, doing a little bit of touring around Romania. So I, this morning, we found out that the video wasn't watching. They tried to tune in. Uh, it's in the afternoon there. They've already been to a couple worship services that they probably didn't understand any word that was spoken. Uh, so I bet they're watching now. So everybody turn around to the camera, say, hey, y'all. 
Buna, Buna Ziwa is how you say good afternoon in Romanian. So it's uh, almost time for good evening there. Uh, but it looks like they've had a, a, a great trip. Uh, what an incredible experience to travel to another country and serve the Lord, uh, even when you can't understand what's being spoken in the church. It's a neat feeling to know that you are among brothers and sisters. And you may not understand exactly what they're saying, but you get the gist of it. Uh, it's a fun experience to, to worship with people that, that you don't understand. The last uh, 10 days or so, just a little over a week, um, I've had the opportunity to speak with some of the middle schoolers here in our county. I spoke uh, a week ago Friday at Central Academy to their Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And then this past Thursday morning uh, to Reed Mountain's group of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Uh, between both schools, over probably 250 kids, 270 kids or so between those two schools. Uh, they're, they're doing fantastic, but for 10 days or so, I was trying to figure out like what, what kind of message can I share with this group of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And so I'm thinking about sports and the gospel and I, I come to baseball because here we are in October. It's the best time of year for baseball because it's the postseason. And so I was thinking about baseballs, and I had th this idea. I've, I've got a couple of these major league baseballs. These are not the official league, little league baseballs that you can go and, and buy at Walmart for 4 or $5. These are official major league baseballs, exact specifications for major league baseball. Um, this, this ball right here from Walmart is, is $20. For one baseball. The average life of a baseball in uh, a major league game is seven pitches. Before it gets dirty, it gets tossed out, or before it gets fouled off and into the crowd. They last for about seven pitches. So the ball in my left hand, I shared with the students, is a $20 major league baseball. This other major league baseball is worth about $200. And I asked them, like, what, what's the difference? They're the exact same. What makes one more valuable than the other? And, you know, hands kind of go up and they're trying to guess what's special about the ball. And I finally spun this one around, and I said, this ball has a signature from a Hall of Fame baseball player on it. My childhood uh, sports hero, Cal Ripken Jr., uh, at one time held this ball in his hands and signed his name to it. And immediately this ball became much more valuable than this ball. And I shared with the middle schoolers, I said, in the same way, we looked at Psalm 139, and I said, uh, God has literally knit you together in your mother's womb exactly the way that you are, exactly the way that he wants you to be. And the world will oftentimes tell us that we're not good enough or something is wrong with us or we're, we're just not worth what other people are worth. And I told the kids, don't let that lie sink into your heart because God has held you, just like Cal held this baseball in his hand, you are held in the hand of God. He knit you together in your mother's womb and has created you the exact way he wants you to be. And because of that, you have extreme value and worth. And so thinking about baseball over the last week and a half uh, reminded me that, you know, this, this is my favorite time of the year, the fall, October, postseason baseball. And it made me think we have an anniversary of an important event coming up here in just a few weeks. And as I was growing up, we never really talked about this anniversary very much. I didn't know a whole lot about it. And so I like to as much as I can in October, take some time to focus on um, this important event because we are here today because of an event that happened on October 31st, 1517. It's been a while. It's been a hot minute since this happened, all right? Uh, but it's an important, it's, it's, it's why we're here today. And on October 31st, 1517, there was a, a German monk named Martin Luther who on that day, he, he nailed 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And these 95 theses, they were written in Latin because Latin was the language of the, uh, of the scholarly at the time. It wasn't written in German for everybody to read. This was, these were just some discussion points that he wanted to talk about with some of the other professors at the school that he taught at. Luther was a devout Christian but was terrified of the idea of a righteous God. Because Luther, in his heart of hearts, knew that he was not a righteous person. He was so afraid to die and face judgment because he knew that he couldn't live up to God's perfect and holy standard. And as he was teaching at the University of Wittenberg, he, he taught through the book of Psalms, 
And, and then he got into the book of Romans, which is where we're going to be today. And Luther, later in his life, described what he had as a Damascus Road experience. As he was reading through Romans, the first few chapters, and it kept talking about the righteousness of God, and he was, he was so afraid of it. He was so afraid of it that he would spend six hours a day confessing his sins. And I'm kind of thinking, you're, you're a monk. What could you possibly do that will take you six hours a day to confess? But he was petrified of this righteous God that we serve. And, and so he had this Damascus Road experience where he's reading through the, the book of Romans. And he comes to the realization that, that the righteousness of God that Romans and, and the Bible talks about is, is not like what the church taught at the time. The church taught that. As you did good works, as you confessed your sin, as you came to church, as you gave to the church, as you gave to the poor, as you filled Operation Christmas Child boxes, that God would pour grace into your life. He would infuse grace, little drops at a time, and slowly your righteousness would be built up. What Luther came to the realization was that that's not the way that it works, that that God's righteousness is given completely wholly to us uh, through faith in Jesus. And so the, he writes these 95 theses. He's like, yeah, I've, I've got some things I want to talk about. He wasn't trying to start a reformation or break away from the Catholic Church. He just wanted to have discussions and try to make some reforms. And there are two basically main themes to these 95 points. And the main themes are, number one, that our sole authority in matters of faith is Scripture, not someone else or a board or a church, or a group of people, or one person, but Scripture is our ultimate authority. And then the second point was that justification, what makes us right with God, happens by faith alone, not by what we do, like was uh, being taught in his time. The Bible basically teaches, a, a good work in definition for us this morning of justification, is that justification is a gracious act of God by which he declares a sinner to be righteous, that comes through faith in Jesus. It's something that God does for us that we cannot do on our own. Going back to the, the baseball analogy, as I was thinking about baseball and chatting with some middle schoolers, uh, I, I opened up a bunch of old boxes in my basement uh, because I've got a lot of baseball cards. As a kid, I used to love to collect baseball cards. Every time we would go to the gas station, I would spend a a couple bucks on a a pack of tops or Fleer or uh, or upper deck baseball cards. And for the most part, you know, growing up in the 80s and and, and 90s, most of those cards are not super valuable. Really, the older cards are the ones that are valuable. And so I didn't, like, open any packs with super amazing, valuable baseball cards. But upper elementary, maybe middle school, I was given a baseball card that was valuable. My aunt and uncle knew Uh, that I was a big baseball fan, a a card collector, and so they gave me 1982 Topps number 21 Future Stars card. And I can tell you're just like, oh, that's great, Josh. (laughs) Okay, let me explain. Let me explain this card. All right, on on this 1982 Topps number 21 card, there are pictures of three people. All right, it's not just a usual card. It has one person. The first picture is a guy by the name of Bob Bonner. Okay, he was a shortstop for the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, And remember, this is a future stars card. All right, Bob was the the, the second baseman. I'm sorry, the second baseman for the Orioles. He played three seasons of professional baseball. He played in 61 total games, had 21 hits, scored 15 runs, uh, with eight runs batted in for a career. All right, future star. The the next person over on the right-hand side of the card was Jeff Schneider, who was a pitcher for the Orioles. He... Played one major league season. He appeared in 11 games for a total of 24 innings. His record was zero wins, zero losses, and one save. He had 17 strikeouts and allowed 13 earned runs in those games. And then the player in the middle of the card is my man, Cal Rifkin Jr. Okay? Cal played in 3,001 career games, playing 2,632 of them consecutively. He had 3,000-plus hits, 430-plus home runs, and a Hall of Fame career. When I got this card as a middle schooler, uh, my aunt and uncle who bought it for me uh, paid about $75 for it. This is not a picture of my actual card. This is, we'll talk about that in a second. But I, I got this card at $75, which is a lot for a piece of cardboard with a gum stain on the back. 
all right? Nowadays, that card that I have is probably worth $150, $200. It's gone up in value. But the value of this card has nothing to do with Bob Bonner or Jeff Schneider. The only reason this card has any value at all is because of the man in the middle, Cal Ripken Jr. Can you imagine uh, Bob, you know, going back to Oriole, Orioles reunion and talking about, hey, my Tops 21, 1982, worth 200 bucks, right? I can't imagine Jeff Schneider going and talking to a group from the FCA and taking any kind of real sense of pride, like he had ownership in the fact that his card is valuable. This card that you were looking at on the screen, it's, it's the same card that I have, but this one has been graded. You guys see in the right hand, kind of bottom corner, it says Jim Empty, Jim Mint, Mint Condition 10, 10 out of 10. They, they grade sports cards, uh, 10 is the perfect grade. Now, to get an old card, to have a grade of 10 is very rare, right? So this exact card, you can, you can look it up after the service. Don't pull your phone out, right? But if you Google 1982 Tops number 21, uh, that card right there is being sold right now for $3,900 because it's in mint condition, right? And it has nothing to do with Bob Bonner or Jeff Schneider. It's all about Cal Ripken. And in the same way, church, it's the, it's, that's the way that justification works. It has nothing to do with us or our work or our own righteousness. It is all because of the man in the middle, Jesus, and what he has done for us. So Luther, as he's reading through Romans, he, he's, he's reading it in Latin. Because for years and years and years, the Bible was written in Latin. Because that's how it was taught in the churches. That's how it was taught in the seminaries. The, the average ordinary person couldn't read the Bible. But the, the ministers could. And so he's reading in Latin. And in Latin, there's a Latin word. I'm trying not to get too nerdy and geek out on you all here. But there's a Latin word that's justificare. Right? It's where we get the word justification. It literally means to make righteous. So in Romans, Luther's reading and he reads this justificare, to make righteous. And that, is the, that was the theology of the Catholic Church, that, that you are made righteous by the things that you do. Luther was a smart man and could read and speak many different languages. He looked to the Greek New Testament, because originally the New Testament was written in Greek, not Latin. And as he's reading the Romans in Greek, he comes across the word for righteousness, which is dikaiosune. Dikaiosune in Greek means to be declared righteous. And Luther has this revelation that dikaiosune is a, a legal term, like if you were to go on trial, right? And at the end of the trial, the judge declares you to be not guilty. That's who you are, because the judge declared you to be that. And Luther has this realization that it's we're, we're not made righteous by the things that we do, but the Greek that, wrought, that Paul wrote here says that God declares us righteous, and that is what makes us righteous. So this morning, we're going to be, the, the scripture passage in your bulletin is Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I want to back up just a little bit so we get kind of a fuller picture of what Paul is writing here. Would you guys, if you have your Bibles, open to Romans chapter 3. We'll start in verse 21 and make our way through chapter 4, verse 5. I love the point in the service where the pastor asks you to turn to a passage of scripture and it gets quiet and all you hear is the, the pages turning. That's a great sound because in the youth room, a lot of times it's just on the phone. You don't hear anything, right? So I like hearing the, the Bible pages turn in the sanctuary. In verse 21 of chapter 3, Paul says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at that present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of the law, the law that requires works. No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person 
is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of course, Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold it. And then we flip over to chapter 4. He continues this same talking about how we are justified by faith and uses Abraham as an example. In verse 1, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. We read this passage and you, you kind of have to wonder, it's like, well, how, for so long, how did we get the idea that, that this justification being made right with God was by any other way other than as a free gift? Right? It's, it's difficult to kind of understand, but that, that's the way that a, a lot of people do see it, that our works play into our salvation. We have to participate with God to be righteous, to become right with God. This past summer, uh, in our Sunday school class, we, we did a, a video series on the book of James. And James is a wonderful book. It's not like all of the New Testament isn't wonderful. It's all wonderful. But James is a really great book because it's very just practical. You know, Romans is very deep theological. James is like, all right, how do we take that and put it into practice in your everyday life? And we had a great discussion about this exact same topic, faith and works, right? Because Romans here, Paul is telling us that it, salvation is all about faith. It's not about works at all. James, at first glance, would kind of disagree with Paul. And we had, we had a great discussion. If you have your Bibles open still, flip over to James chapter 2. Uh, we'll just look at a couple verses here and kind of take James' perspective on, on faith and works. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17 is where we'll focus our attention here. James says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, has no works? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, Keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. And so we kind of have, at first glance, it's like, well, Paul's saying one thing, but James is saying faith without works is, is dead, like we have to have the works as well. And James asked the question there at the end of verse 14. He said, can such faith save them? And we just read, Paul says that we're justified by faith. We're saved by faith. It's, it is, John Calvin would come along and say that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is the hinge on which the gospel hangs. It all comes down to justification by faith. And James says, can that faith save him? What James is talking about here is a dead faith, not a real living faith. Look at the beginning of verse 14. What good is it if someone claims to have faith they claim to have faith. They don't actually have faith. Because James says, if you have faith, you will produce good works. If you have a dead faith, it's not going to save you because it's not a real faith. James says a real faith that saves you is going to be accompanied by works. So James and Paul are not disagreeing here. Paul says we're saved by faith apart from works. James says if you have a real living faith, works are going to come with it. It's not the works that save you. It's the faith, but the works go along with the faith. For years and years and years, people had this theology of we have to work with God. We have to earn our salvation. We have to get more righteous on a daily basis. And looking back on it now, we can kind of look and say, how, how did that ever happen? But yet at the same time, we can fall into the trap of thinking that we have to earn grace or earn forgiveness. Uh, we often feel guilty because of our sin, and we feel like we need to make it up to God or earn our forgiveness, giving to the church or serving in the church, leading in vacation Bible school. We're thinking, Lord, you better be, uh, I better be paying for my sins here with all these children, right? I should be earning some grace, Father, right? 
we, we get the idea that we're going to go on a mission trip and we're going to serve and we're going to be like, we're just going to, yeah, just fill up with righteousness and get more, get more forgiveness. It doesn't work that way. Most everything in life that we have is a, you, you, you pay it back. You, you owe a debt, you pay it back, right? You take a, a mortgage on a house, you take a loan for a car, right? You pay it back, right? But when it comes to salvation, Luther, who was terrified of the idea of a righteous God, so terrified that he would spend six hours a day praying and confessing his sin, had a Damascus Road experience where he realized that it's, it's not about me and the work that I do. The work has already been done for me, and I get to receive the benefit. Just like Bob Schneider and Jeff, uh, Bob Bonner and Jeff Schneider, right? The, the value of the card is not on their work. It's on the work of Cal, right? The, the value of our righteousness with God, the, the source of our salvation and being made right with God is not about our work. It's about the work that, that Jesus did for us. There are a, a lot of expensive baseball cards out there, right? If, if you get into collecting or used to collect, you know that there, it, it's easy to find uh, expensive cards. Recently, about a year ago, the most expensive card ever sold was sold. It was August 28, 2022, and that was a, a 1952 Mickey Mantle card. It was purchased in 1991 for $50,000. And it was sold in 2022 for $12.6 million. Um, I would call that a, a good investment. <laughs> uh, the, the Ditzlers came up to me before the service, and, and he said, he said I, I'm kicking myself after your first service because when I was a kid, I went and I, I met Mickey Mantle in Florida at spring training. He signed a ball for me. He was like, and I lost it. <laughs> like, oh. It's like, oh, it's such a great memory, or maybe it's not a, <laughs> maybe it's not a great memory. Right? The 1982 Tops number 21 is not worth $12.6 million. It's not the most expensive card ever. Right? But it is a great picture of justification for us. How we are made right based off of someone else and not our own. A few years ago, a while back, there was an Englishman uh, who had saved his money and invested it in a, a Rolls Royce. He had wanted one since he was young, and, and he saved and saved and saved, and he, he bought the Rolls Royce that he wanted. He loved his car, and he decided that he wanted to, to take it on holiday with him to tour Europe. Now, if you all are you know, geographically challenged like I am sometimes, England, right, up here, right, then there's the sea, and then there's Europe, right? So he had to put the, had to put the car on a boat. He couldn't just drive from England to France or Germany, wherever. He put the car on a boat rode the boat across the English Channel, and spent some time touring Europe on holiday. It wasn't too long into his vacation, he started noticing a knocking sound in the engine of the Rolls-Royce, and he kind of wondered about it, but didn't really know what to do, so he did what many of us do, he just kept driving. <laughs> It'll be fine. He keeps driving, the, the knocking gets louder and louder and worse and worse, to a, a, gets to the point where the, the car's breaking down. I used to pull over uh, in this little town. His, his dream car, the one he spent so much money on, that Rolls Royce, is, is broken. And, and, and he, he writes to Rolls Royce in England and tells them what's going on. He says, I, I, I'm on holiday in Europe. My car has broken down. Something's wrong with the engine. I don't know what it is. What should I do? And he waits a little while and receives a response from Rolls Royce. They put a mechanic on an airplane and fly him to where this man is. The, air, the man gets off the airplane with his tools, comes and works on the car, repairs the car, and then flies back to England. And so the man is thinking, this is, this is going to be an expensive bill when I get home. So he finishes his holiday, loads back up on the boat, goes home, writes a letter, because he never receives the bill, writes a letter to Rolls Royce saying, how much do I owe you for your service in my vehicle? Rolls-Royce writes him back and says, Dear sir, there is no record anywhere in our files that anything ever went wrong with a Rolls-Royce. And that, that is justification. For many of us who have put our faith in Jesus and, and trust in his finished work, one day we're going to stand before God, just like Martin Luther feared. 
we're going to stand before this holy and righteous and perfect God. And because of what Jesus did for us, it's just like the letter from Rolls Royce. That there's no record of any wrong ever done. Because your value comes from the man in the middle of the car, not from your own work. And so this morning as we wrap up our time together, we have an invitation every week, right? And there are different kinds of people in this room today. Uh, maybe you are a believer who you've trusted in Jesus, but you still feel like you have to work and kind of earn that forgiveness or earn a little bit of righteousness. We fall into that from time to time. This is a great time to come and say, hey, it, this, is, uh, this is October. 506 years ago, we, Martin Luther came up with this, this, this idea that set him free, that righteousness is based on grace and grace alone. It's a free gift. There are those of us here today who have never made a decision to follow Jesus. If, if you were to die and stand before that holy God, maybe you have the same terror that Martin Luther had, knowing that you are a sinner and there is no hope. There's nothing that you can do. Right? As Paul writes in Romans, the, we are saved, we are made righteous by believing in Jesus. We get all the benefits of Jesus by believing in him. So this morning, I would love to talk with you and pray with you and, and lead you to, to know that you can have a security in your salvation today. And then there are other people who are, maybe you've been visiting the church for a while and you say, Mill Creek is a great church. It's a wonderful place full of people who love the Lord. I want to be a part of what God is doing at Mill Creek. Then this morning as Cindy comes and the band plays one final song, if you have any business that you want to do with God here at the front, it's open for you. If you want to um, come forward to, to join this church, I'd love to talk to you and welcome you here. Would you stand with us as we sing this final song?